These are all cryptocurrency wallets. They all can store Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Now, as you can see from the vast array here, I've gone through quite a few. And it's for good reason as well. Because keeping your cryptocurrency safe using one of these wallets is at the heart of crypto. After all, you gotta protect your cryptographic keys from theft and from hackers. Crypto doesn't care about who you are. It doesn't care about my identity. It doesn't care about my passport. There's no customer service to call if something goes wrong. And because of that, we have to use some of these hardware to get that extra layer of added security. Which is in many ways I, why I'm reviewing the Engrave wallet. Engrave, they're coming up with the kind of next generation of cryptocurrency wallets. They're calling this the coldest of all cold wallets. And when I first saw it, I'm like, how can you be colder? How can you be even more safe than something we've been discussing here, like the Ledger Nano S? And it turns out, yeah, you can. There's still a few security issues that they, they, they did brought up and they fixed. So this kind of warrants why there is a new device. It's even safer. Um, it has a new way of storing those keys. And it also has some interesting recovery features, which we're talking about in this video. For full disclosure, I am partnering with Engrave to help promote their Indiegogo campaign for the device. But whilst talking about this, I do reserve my own opinions for everything. And I did a lot of due diligence on this device because at the end of the day, it's about storing cryptocurrencies which is why I spent a lot of time analyzing what security measures they have and how this compares with the Ledger, Trezor, and for the hell, for the, for the hell keep, the keep key here and even your USB or your wallet here. I talk about the differences in this video as well. So we established in the introduction that device security is very important, especially if you're keeping cryptocurrencies. Now, when it comes to actually attacking the device, there's actually two major attack vectors. So one of them being from the internet. Um, hackers can try to figure out or trick you into running some form of malicious code. And this happens a lot. You heard about viruses, you know, that rages on in the computer world. And some of them, because they can run code, they can try to hack your other devices too which is why we almost never leave our cryptocurrency keys on your actual computer because it's pretty simple for a hacker to just take it and use it and take all your cryptocurrencies. That's why when it comes to protecting yourself from online hackers, the further away, the more offline your device is, the better. That's why the OG crypto guys would all like a paper wallet because paper is unhackable. It's literally doesn't have any electronics. It's literally removed from the internet. But of course, with paper, sending a transaction would be incredibly hard. And this is why the engrave now becomes the coldest wallet. It's because there's no physical connection between the device and the outside world. And the way to communicate is via QR codes. So as I alluded to previously, QR codes can only contain a small amount of information which is just enough for the transaction to go through. You can't really run even kilobytes of malicious code by just scanning a QR code. So this is why the Android is very, very novel when it comes to communication. By having no form of communication online, hackers can definitely not access that device. There's no USB cable, there's no Bluetooth, there's no Wi-Fi to access the, the device. So you can just pretty much consider it as a cold store, cold storage for cryptocurrencies. What's also interesting about Engrave is that it has a totally different key generation process. It's actually interactive and it adds additional layers of security. And also on top of this, Engrave has the highest level EAL7 certification for hardware devices. To find out a little bit more about this, I had an interview call with the co-founders of Engrave, Ruben Mere and Xavier Hendricks, and we talked a little bit about their passion behind the device and these extra features as well. I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. Back, in, back when you started the project, you didn't find any hardware wallets that were satisfying your solution. So yep. what were they missing, you know, from the ones that we have? I mean, Treasure and Lesser are hot. You know, what were they missing? What did they not have? Didn't know what did they not have? Yeah, yeah sure. 
Yeah, so what, what we tried to, to think about was a statement and to what extent that statement was true at that time in the market. So, and the statement for us was, when do you exactly start truly owning what is yours, right? And if you think about banks, banks can say at any moment in time, the $100,000 you have here, we've never seen it, right? Cryptocurrency exchanges can say the exact same thing. They're still too centralized today. And the one thing that comes closest to start truly owning what is yours are hardware wallets. But if you look closer under the hood, you see that there are still so many things missing. And it all starts obviously with how do you generate a private key? If the private key is not generated in the right way, you cannot start truly owning what is yours. So we looked at the existing solutions and what we found were two problems. The first one is that um, they almost all of them rely on the interior chip that generates the private key. And these chips have been developed for the last decades to almost perfection. But the problem with them is that they have back doors or they are uh, likely to have a back door, which has actually been proven time and time again, even in articles in 2020 by Fortune and so on. So these chips cannot be completely trusted because there are third parties who might know what your key is. So we said good enough. That means that we can use the chip but we cannot rely completely on the chip. So we actually introduce uh, external factors in real time happening when you're making the key. It's very simple. For example, your fingerprint is included in the key generation process, but also the ambient light at that specific moment in time is measured through your camera and is taken as an input into your key generation process. So we basically take the interior chip, we take outside and elements, we put that together. And that, in our case, eliminates uh, most of the risks of these back doors. The second issue we okay. saw was that hardware wallet manufacturers, they uh, give you a key. So an existing wallet just says, here's your key, write it down on a piece of paper, keep it safe. And it's, still, it's, it's a residual, super tiny risk, and we don't actually think they, they do it. But for us, residual risks are not allowed in our security module, model. And, and what I'm talking about is, is the fact that they might have a database of all the keys they ever made, because that's what they do. They mm -hmm. give you a key. So we said, there must be a way that you can interact with your key so that at the end of the process, you know that you have made a key that even engraved the manufacturer has no idea of knowing, no idea of brute forcing anymore. Mm -hmm. So the way we do that is by a very easy interaction process where you can make no mistakes, but we designed it together with the world, world leading experts in cryptography to make sure that this thing is still a very strong key. You make it completely offline because our zero doesn't need USB or doesn't need uh, network connections. It's, it's offline. And um, you also have this random process. So you, you suddenly have an, a whole new um, version of a key that gives you the starting point to start truly owning what is yours. And we have done upgrades in the entire process for the user um, every time we saw something like that. That could That's compromise awesome. your so, security. So it's actually, it's actually even safer because you're basically saying that there's a chance, there's an off chance that the secure modules that are being used right now and deployed to give you the key. So when you regenerate a new key on a ledger or a treasure, et etc., you say, okay, look, that can, can't be fully trusted because just in case the manufacturer ha or not even the manufacturer, maybe even the chip manufacturer right, has a backdoor to it. So now by introducing these extra elements, do you introduce any security risks to that? Because that's my first immediate question. Now, now you're adding you know, all these factors in, now you're um, you know, it, it, would it be, it, would it be even more secure or would it be less secure? Yeah. So, um, we understood that from the, from the very beginning, okay, we're, we were, we're basically setting out to build the best solution in the world. So that meant that we couldn't just do it with the three of us. We needed the best partners in the world to do so. So after two months of building our own functional prototype, we approached the world leading research and development institution for nanotechnology called IMEC. Mm -hmm. And um, we shared with them our vision, we showed them our prototype, and they basically enrolled us in their tech acceleration program. And after a few months, they also noticed these guys are not kidding around. We actually want to partner with you to build the solution. And uh, another important partnership was with COSIC, C-O-S-I-C, which is um, one of the world leading research groups for cryptography and hardware security. For example, they have hacked the Tesla cars in like two minutes. Tesla did a patch, they hacked them again in two minutes. So these guys are really serious about um, cryptography and about, let's say, say having the, the user enter the key generation process. In the, in the beginning, they said, you should never do that. But, um, Actually, you can do it without um, 
uh, let's say, um, reducing the entropy of the key, like mm. the randomness of the key, which is crucial. Um, so what we did is we, we the entropy remains the same. You cannot remove entropy by adding, uh, let's say, maybe less random factors. But what you can, and what you, what the only risk you then have is you can do things that people uh, do, which is people are predictable, right? People are psychologically, mm-hmm. you can basically map out what you're going to do. So there we really had to figure out a process where users couldn't just say, I can change any character in the key and I'm going to change the first one to a one, then the second key I ever make to a two. <laughs> because people will do that. So we had to find a way to make the interaction intuitive, fast, but also such that uh, users couldn't make the key worse. And if you look at our key, key generation process today, you will realize that indeed it, it's it will become difficult for us to know what the key is, but it will also be difficult for the user to just um, do whatever he wants. Now, you're running this project on Indiegogo, so you're selling the Engrave Zero wallet. Now, what's the kind of production capability right now? So like, if you start buying it, people start buying it, will it where, where will it get produced? Do you have the prototype ready? What's the, what's the status? Yeah, good question. So um, when you go to Indiegogo, you will also see, I think in the next coming days that we are in the in production phase. So no longer in the prototype phase. Um, mm-hmm. And we realized that some things are typically bottlenecks in, uh, in buildings, uh, or let's say in industrializing uh, solutions like this. And one of them is building the mold or the matrix for um, the casing of the device. And so what mm-hmm. we did there is we made sure that we were well ahead of time. We delivered to the matrix or the molds in uh, February. And we already had the first out of tools, as they call it, um, like a month later. And we can actually, are we actually going to do that in the next coming days after this video is recorded? Um, um, be starting to show the process, right? The progress. So basically, mm-hmm. you can see that these devices are there. They're being sprayed on with a special kind of varnish. And um, you will basically see these guys are actually building it uh, in, in mass mm-hmm. production right now. Um, Okay, so, so, so yeah. you're building the, um, the mask, but how about the chipset and everything else inside? Is that, is that being manufactured as well, or would that take a lot more time? No, so we, we developed, the, let's say, the device in the PCB, like the electronic circuitry board and so mm-hmm. on. We developed it from scratch. Yeah? So we designed it from scratch. We took the, the components we liked from where we could find them. Um, and today, that, that board is ready. We also mm-hmm. already have our assembly uh, partner ready. Yeah? It's 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 uh, it's based. They're based in Belgium. Also, our uh, mechanical partner is also based in Belgium. So, for max quality and for being able to manage the risks of the supply chain really well, we decided to do all of it in Belgium. Because for us, wow. at the end of the day, the customer is who is important, and it's his security, his usability. We don't want to compromise in any way on that. So we said Belgium it is, regardless of the fact that we also looked at other countries and so on. Um, but we noticed that the price was good, um, and especially the quality and the fact that we can drive half an hour and we are in the plant to fix something that really makes it very, very doable for us. Because again, we're three, we're only three guys. Uh, we're, we're partnered up with a lot of amazing people, but it's still us who have to, who have to manage it and do it. All right. So talking about the device, let's say you make the project, you get the device, and we knew that one of the biggest selling points of the device is it's completely offline. Right, so there's it's completely air gap from the rest of the world, which is great. But one of the worries, obviously, is are there any other potential vulnerabilities? Like, do you ever have to connect the device to a cable to update the firmware? We've seen firmware updates being quite popular. How does that work? Well, firmware update is something we spend a lot of time thinking about and got quite challenged. Um, first of all, we decided to use the USB for updates because by really studying the differences between what the competitors use to be mm-hmm. pretty air gap being SD cards. Uh, it doesn't offer any meaningful difference with USB. In the end, it's the same kind of vulnerabilities, the same kind of risk um, that you have with USB cable, even though it doesn't feel like it. Um, but what we decided to do was to allow, allow USB functionality only on a very separate um, separate secure boot partition of our device that is fully, air, fully sandboxed from the rest of the operating system by the secure operating system. So if you want to do an update of our system, you will have to reboot and it will be in the separate boot mode which will only allow uh, at that time the USB connection. Now, second, uh, second important point is that there is different types of updates. The most regular updates will be um, pertaining to the um, what we call the rich OS, which is the OS that is 
uh, not responsible or in charge for security operations. It is mostly in charge for um, driving the peripherals, driving the screen, and uh, um, and also formatting information to be able to uh, add coin supports. So that's where we see most of updates happening. Uh, and those parts will be differential updates, meaning that we will not rewrite the whole firmware. It will just uh, incrementally add new features or remove um, with on a different differential way. This allows us um, to update in the most secure way. Uh, every update by the way will be signed by us. So it will be very verified by the secure OS. Um, uh, so, yeah, this is a really secure way to do updates. Um, there is some um, times there is a possibility that you do a full firmware update um, that will also be signed and verified by the, by the EAL7 certified secure OS. Um, but uh, overall, the parts that are most regularly updated uh, will also be open sourced. So people can actually verify uh, online what's, what's in there. And uh, they can also confirm uh, the validity of the update package by by performing the signature themselves. Got it. So guys, thank you guys so much for telling me a little bit more about Engrave. I hope the Indiegogo goes well. It's already doing very well, but I'm, of course, um, obviously it can definitely go better. So if you guys are interested, definitely check out the Indiegogo campaign and we'll see you guys. Well, I hope to get the device. I'll order one myself and get it hopefully in November. October. <laughs> October. October. Okay. Awesome, guys. So guys, thank you guys so much and I'll see you guys soon. Guys, I hope you guys enjoyed that call and conversation and learned a little bit about security for hardware devices as well. So at the end of the day, the Engrave Zero is definitely the next generation of hardware wallets. Most importantly, it's completely offline, so there's no way for hackers to ever try to tamper with it. And it also has a very large screen to interact with. So every time you're trying to sign a transaction or whatnot, it's a clean, modern interface. The company also created the product Liquid to go along with the app. So this allows you to manage your cryptocurrencies on the go. So you can just see your transactions, but every time you need to sign it, you need the Engrave Zero with you. And lastly, they have the backup solution, Graphene. So Graphene is a stainless steel backup key solution. Typically speaking, a lot of times when I taught people how to use a ledger, etc., you write down your backup phrases on a piece of paper and you hope that piece of paper is safe, especially from fire or decay or the ink running out. With stainless steel, of course, you don't have to worry about any of those things. Stainless steel, just plain and simple, doesn't burn. So you have that additional kind of safekeeping there, knowing that you have your backup, which is safe, and the restoration process, which is a much different and cleaner method of restoring. So now how does this cost? Where, where does this put us in terms of cost? So right now this project is on Indiegogo and for the unit itself, for the, so for the Zero, the hardware wallet, it's right now being sold at 228 euros. And if you're interested in a backup solution, it's 288 for the early bird combo, but there's only around well, 75 left at the time of making this video. So there is a limited supply on these special prices. So when it comes to pricing, it's not cheap, but also it's the most premium experience out there with the larger screen, with the complete offlineness, the better security on the chipset, the better recovery process and the key generation procedure as well. So that's kind of what you're paying for when you're paying that extra bit. In terms of the Indiegogo campaign, what I personally got is the 288 graphene and zero combo. And the reason why I got that is I just wanted to try out the stainless steel recovery phrase. I've never tried anything like this before and I thought that might be relatively interesting. Overall, it doesn't. It seems expensive at first, but keeping your cryptocurrency safe, honestly, is more valuable. I've lost more Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies than I can probably count due to bad storage in the past when these weren't available. And I'm just glad we're at this stage right now. I'd love to hear what you guys think of the device. I've seen a few people chat about it on our live chats, and I'd love to hear what your feedback so far and what you think is good and not good about the device. Leave a comment down below. I also ordered it, so I will be getting it in October once it releases, and I'll give you a full hardware review then. Until again, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure you like and subscribe to this video, and of course, click the thumbs up button as well, and I'll see you in the next video.